And uh, we're going to be even more organized this next year. And so I encourage you to, uh, 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 if, if that's something that you're involved with, which I think most everybody here is, but, but uh, if you can, come there and, and put your input into it. Amen? Uh, because that's what makes these runs even better each year, is if we're actually having input. Uh, I'll tell you, I have less patience with somebody who doesn't get involved, but then after an event says, well, we should have done this. And then in the, in the Christian love, I want to tell them, well, shut up. <laughs> or get involved, amen? <laughs> so, so at any rate, so uh, I don't mean that. I would never tell somebody to shut up. Hey, Pastor, I have an announcement from the back. Yes. The Kids Carnival is Saturday the 20th. Martha has sign-up sheets for volunteers to help with the carnival, and we're still needing new bikes donated and or money to buy new bikes to give away at the carnival. Yeah, we usually give about 20 bikes away, don't we? Yeah. And Anywhere so we need to get to those 20. bikes bought or made do donations so we can buy those bicycles. It's do what? How much is a bike? Well, it depends on the type of bike. My Harley was, uh, no, I just, <laughs> no, but we give away bicycles, and so, you know, uh, what do we generally spend? Everybody's talking, so I can't hear. About $100? Okay, all right. All righty, so let's get started uh, with this. Uh, we've been talking about how to live a victorious life. Uh, you know, it, we know that God doesn't want us poor, broke, busted, disgusted, mad, and angry, and disappointed, and depressed, and all those negative things. That, that's not what uh, God wants us to, to, to be. And yet we're human beings, so we go through all kinds of things, but, but we ought to be going through it and actually get, accomplishing something with our life. Amen? And so we've been talking about that. There are steps to living a victorious life, a happy life. And we want to talk about that. So the, the first principle is be generous with your time, your talents, your money, with everything that you have. Be a generous person. Stingy people don't do well at life. And so be the type of person that's a giver. Be involved in things and, and give in to things. And, and uh, people think I'm always just talking about money. Money's part of it. That's not all of it. Because uh, we, we, need, we need your time involved. We need your input. Like today we're having a, this meeting right after the, about our Tougher Than Help poker run that benefits the, the uh, camp, for, uh, camp quality that helps kids with cancer. And uh, so be involved. The, the principle, number one principle we started off with in this whole series was give. Give and you shall receive. That's, that's, a, that's a biblical principle. And, uh, uh, and, and he says that you'll receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give you. There's no counterfeit operation in heaven. You're not going to be saying, I'm a giver, so now God's going to start showering $100 bills out of heaven. Not going to happen that way. But God will bless you for being a blessing. Amen? The second principle we talked about was the one that always really got to people, and that's, a, that's the biblical uh, uh, principle of exclusion. Get rid of what you don't want to make room for what you do want. We all have a lot of clutter inside of our lives, and uh, we ought to get rid of it. You even have relationships that are toxic. They're toxic. You're not being a blessing to them, and and they're dragging you down. Because there are people in this world, it's a mathematical equation. There are some people that will add to you. There are some people that will multiply you. But there are some people that will subtract from your life, and they'll divide your life. Amen? Don't hang around people that are, that, uh, are going to subtract and divide inside of your life. Hang around people that are. Do, we minister to people who are going through all kinds of things. But our primary fellowship should be with people of like faith doing something with their life. Amen? And so uh, the third principle was the, that we talked about earlier was the principle of creation. And that, it, that merely means that the very creative power of God is in operation in everybody in this room who knows Jesus. I mean, man has accomplished great things technologically, uh, uh, medically, all kinds of different things. Uh, uh, 
I mean, great writings and, and art and, and, and architecture. And um, I mean, we have developed great things. Well, great things come down from God because how do I know that the gr great creative things are from God? Because he said every good and wonderful gift comes down from the Father of lights. And so there are many people that, that say, I don't know where I got the idea, but I was sitting there and I had this idea. And it's a very creative idea. And that creative idea came from God because he cares about people. Amen. Amen. So believe in the creative power of God that's in operation. You were created in his image. Now, don't take it to extremes. You're never going to create a world and become God over it. There's already one God. And we would stink at it. But the truth about it is, is that uh, uh, but there's great creative power. The fourth principle was get a vision for something. He said, my people perish for a lack of vision. Get a vision for something inside of your life. Did you know without purpose, you just wither away? You need to get a vision and, and fill that vision with emotion and hold on to it. Amen? Get a hold of God's vision for your life. Remember when God spoke to Joshua, he said, uh, when you're getting ready to take Jericho, he said, See, I've given you this city and its mighty men. I'm telling you what, you can get a vision from God on where you're going to go in life. And once you know your direction and you know your purpose, can I tell you something? It gives you, uh, it gives you that reason to live and to keep moving on, you know. And uh, uh, I, I've told this story before, but I remember a gal one time that when I was driving Uber, got in the car, and she complained about her life all the way home. I was looking forward to dropping her off. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and you, I couldn't get a word in edgewise. And finally she said, I don't know what happened to me because I, was, I took care of a man for nine years who was uh, terminally ill. And when he passed away, I, I, I left my husband, my kids, and everything that I knew, and I just drew into myself. She goes, I don't know what happened. And she said, uh, I wonder what happened. And I said, do I get to talk now? And she goes, yeah, what? And I said, well, you lost your vision. For nine years, your purpose in life was to take care of this man. And when he died... You didn't know what your purpose were anymore. We don't do well without purpose in our life. And I said, so you suddenly became lost and didn't know what you were going to do. But you, you know what? God has a purpose and he never goes away. Hallelujah. Find out what God's purpose is for your life. Get a hold of that vision and hold on. And then we talked about the fifth principle was this right here, the principle of command. And all these principles are things you could take to extreme but, you know, uh, uh, one of Job's friends had made this statement. He said, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy way. But it was a true statement that he'd made because uh, uh, we ought to be able to command those things that God commands. Amen? In other words, there are things in the Bible that we should pray for, and there are things in the Bible that we should command into being. And not because we're God, but because we're saying what God told us to say. And over and over in Scripture, uh, we're told, you know, even, even Jesus said, you know, uh, one of these days you're going to be brought before magistrates and everything else. He said, don't think about what you're going to say because the, you won't be the one speaking, but the Holy Spirit will speak through you. So I'm not talking about you just having a whim and speaking it out. I'm talking about when God says to command something, command it. Because so many times in the Bible, uh, uh, people would, uh, would take the, God's word and, what, and he would, they would speak to it. You know, you don't, you, don't find, you don't find Jesus casting out devils by going like this. Would you, would you please come out of that person? I, I really wish that you'd come out of that person. You know why? There was no authority in that. But there are certain things that we pray for and certain things that we command. And those things that we command, we command because God has spoken to us. Amen? I want to tell you something. Christians operate right here when we should be operating right there. When the Bible says that we're seated in heavenly places, it's not talking about physically seated, but that we have a place of authority beside Christ. Amen? We need to take that authority and command some things. 
You know, he didn't, Jesus didn't say if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could beg a mountain to move. No, no. He said, you could speak into that mountain, say, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And, and if you believe, now here's what I love about that verse. Mark eleven twenty four. it tells you this. It tells you that, uh, uh, so if you believe that those things which you say shall come to pass, you'll have whatever you say. So we need to be operating some faith and commanding some things in our life. You know, there are certain things you pray about, and there are certain things you command. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, the sixth principle of victorious living, and that's action. In other words, do it now. Or if I could have found a verse that said, get off thy hind end, <laughs> I would have quoted it, but I couldn't find that verse. But anyway, do it now. Don't be a procrastinator in your life. You can watch time go by. You can watch opportunities go by. You can see doors open and doors shut because of fear and, and, and misconceptions that you have that keep, that keep you putting off decisions until tomorrow. Now, I know there's a lot of us that have always felt like, why do today what you can do at a different time? But there's no success involved in that. Self-discipline means I do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether I want to do it or not. That's what discipline is. I do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether I want to do it or not. And there are things I don't want to do. But there are certain things I have to do anyway. Did you know, uh, I, I've had people over the years say, well, I don't know... What, those scriptures just come up to your mind. No, the Holy Ghost does that, but he has to have something to work with, so I spend a lot of time in the Bible. Now, did you know I have to discipline myself to, write, uh, to, to, to uh, read the Bible? I don't have to discipline myself to get on my motorcycle and take a ride. But I have to discipline myself sometimes to say, I'm not going to take a ride. I'm going to study, and I'm going to take care of this because I'm going to do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether I want to do it or not. That's what discipline is all about. So you need to take some action inside of your life. Proverbs 29, 1 said, Boast not thyself of, uh, of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day uh, bring forth. Now there's one thing good about procrastination. You know what it is? You always have something planned for tomorrow. You can always got a plan for tomorrow if you're a procrastinator, because that's the, you know. Debbie and I used to joke about it when it came to dieting. We always felt like tomorrow was a better day than today to diet. Man, I'm going to start my diet. When? I mean, tomorrow. Or Monday. As soon as we get back off vacation, by golly, we're going to start eating right. We're going to go to Sturgis and eat some Indian tacos, but then <laughs> when we get back, we're going to do that. James 4.13 says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. In other words, you, you make plans. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. Now, it's not saying don't plan. He would never say that because God gave plans. But there's sometimes when we come up with ideas, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. But you know what? I need to be led by the Holy Ghost in what I do, where I'm going to go, when I'm going to do it. And you know, rarely do I find the Holy Ghost saying, that thing I want you to do, some other time. Don't make any difference, man. God didn't tell Ab Abram, Listen, get up and get out of that country. Someday, if you get some extra time. Amen? There are a whole lot of people here would be hurt if some of the people you know procrastinated. Imagine this. If, if your employer went like this, said, 
And I'm thinking about it. I was going to make everybody's checks out, but what the heck? Next month's a good time. <laughs> then you'd have to go to the people that you owe money to and say, listen, I was thinking about paying you, but, you know, next month's a good time. I've been, before I got my new heart uh, valve, I had heart surgery six years ago, I remember several times I was brought to the hospital. I'm glad emergency help didn't go, well, we were playing a game of checkers. We'd come now, but we'll come when we're done. There's also a very little uh, known story about a general who was sitting down actually playing a game when George Washington and, and the soldiers were crossing the Delaware and coming to there, and did you know they, they lost much of their fighters and everything else? Why? Because they wanted to finish the game they were playing <laughs> while the enemy was coming on. The enemy's after you, and some of you, your enemy. We, how many people know we have an enemy? And he's got a plan, and he's not putting it off till tomorrow. He's after you today. So you need to be on guard. Amen? John 4.35 said, uh, uh, Jesus says, Say not ye there are four months, and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look in the fields. They're white and all ready to harvest. There are some people who have, in their life, made some horrendous mistakes, but they have time right now. They have the minutes in, uh, in, in their hours and the hours in their day and the days in their life right now where they can change some direction in their life and accomplish great things with their life. If they put it off tomorrow, this day will be gone and you can't get it back. But I love this verse right here in Ephesians 5.15. He'd already told them, Arise uh, you that sleep, which he didn't mean that, that are dead, but people that are acting dead and they're believers. They're acting like unbelievers, but they're actually believers. But then he goes on to say, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Do you know what I love about that? When st you study it out, it literally means God is saying this. You have, may have wasted a bunch of your life, but if you'll start thinking about what you're doing with your time, I'll redeem and restore things in your life if you'll turn around now. Amen? Turn around now. Right now, today, is the best time for you to make a decision that's going to change your life. One of the greatest powers we have as human, be human beings is the ability to change our mind about something. I've been headed this direction, but I'm changing my mind. I had a, a, a biker friend of mine years ago that uh, uh, we'd ministered to and ministered to. And he, j and he took the time to draw me aside one time and said, I'm going to tell you something. When I get ready to make a decision for Christ, you'll be the first to know. I'll call you up and I'll talk to you about it. I said, don't talk to me about it. You get ready to make a decision, just look up to heaven and say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready. You don't have to talk to me. But let me tell you what happened. In a few days, he was killed on that motorcycle, and they buried him with a jug of whiskey on his chest and thought that was really cool. But all I could think about is, I wish he'd have made that decision. Amen? Take the time to make the decisions you ought to make and make them right now. I know you may feel like there's no time like the present for postponing what you want to do. A lot of people really believe that. I, I, I am going to make this. I'm going to make a change in my life. How long have you been saying that? I'm going to get some things in control. I spoke with a good friend not long ago. I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you? Oh, wait, let's wait till they get done talking. I know she does. <laughs> Hey, I want to tell you something. Uh, I, I spoke with a good friend of mine uh, not too long ago, and I told him, I said, if you're not having a devotion with your wife, then get a devotional book and just have a devotion with her. Yeah, yeah, I need to do that. No, I hate that. Well, yeah, I need to do that. What is that? It don't take very long to open up my utmost for his highest, Read a devotion. Have a word of prayer with each other. Bless each other. 
and go about your day. I want to tell you something. Don't stand before God and say, I would have known more about you and accomplished more. But you know, I had my business to run. I had my kids to raise. I had a job to go to. I had a lot of things to do. You don't have anything more important than your relationship to God. And if you get that, if you get first things done first, then I'm going to tell you something. You'll be a better, you'll be a better husband or better wife, better mother or father. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better everything if you, if you get your priorities straight and do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, whether you want to do it or not. I love that term, the sacrifice of praise. I believe in praising God. But you know, sometimes I don't feel like praising God. I praise Him anyway. If I just praise Him when I'm feeling good, that's going to be a tough thing. Oh, if you're wondering about this right here, because I can't seem to make it through a day without hurting myself somewhere. Yeah. I went to the dermatologist uh, a few months ago. I said, what's the deal? I hit myself, I bruise or bleed or something like that. She goes, well, you're old. <laughs> no, it's got to be a different thing than that. Well, it's not a different thing than that. Well, can I put something on there that will restore my skin, make it like it used to be? No. Can I take something internally that will change it? You know, there's a lot of good health things out there. You're just old. And because I have a sick sense of humor, I told her this. People say, I don't, can't believe you say some of that stuff from the pulpit. I told her this. I said, getting old's not good. I even notice I got breasts now that are just... <laughs> As a matter of fact, I said, I get inside of an elevator and, and there's always some guy there that wants to cop a feel. <laughs> and she's got a good sense of humor, so she goes, well, if I was you, I wouldn't get in elevators anymore. <laughs> Getting old is tough, man. But I am so very thankful that, that I have spent 30-some years of my life spending time in the Word no, no matter what happens to me physically or emotionally or anything else, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in God. I know God is taking care of me. Amen? But he leaves, literally says in Ephesians 5 there, uh, don't be unwise. He goes on to say, listen, I, uh, uh, you can redeem the time that you've wasted in this evil day if you'll just turn around. Wherefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of God. Don't be drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be careful and diligent about the time that God's given you. Spend your time wisely. Now, if you tell some people that, they'll say, well, I need, to, I need to work more. That's not what I'm saying. You've got to live a balanced life. Business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. You need, when it's, how many people know resting is good? For some people, fishing is everything. Hunting is everything. For real Christians, riding motorcycles. <laughs> no, I've just... <laughs> Take the time it takes to do the things that you know are right. And please quit making excuses for yourself. The things that you're supposed to do, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it now. I have something that's deposited into my bank of time every day. 86,400 seconds of time. 1,440 minutes. 24 hours. It's deposited in my bank of time every day. And I'm going to make that time deposited in that bank. I'm going to spend it wisely. Amen? Now, what is the opposite of that? Procrastination. Some people love putting things off till tomorrow, the next day, 
whenever. And you should never put off till tomorrow what you could do some other week. <laughs> I saw this statement when I, was, when I was putting all this together. I thought this was cute. Uh, a guy said this. He said, one of these days, I'm going to get help from my procrastination. <laughs> one of these days. Many times we put off going to the doctor. I, I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to let you think about it. Some people, I don't procrastinate. Is that right? There are people I know right in this place right here put off to the, going to the doctor, whether for a checkup or a pain that you're having. You put off, and, and uh, uh, I spoke with a guy in a hospital not too long ago. He said, well, I'm believing in faith. Well, I believe in faith, and I, believe, uh, I, believe in, I have faith in God, and he's the Lord God, my healer, but I'm not an idiot. When I needed a heart valve, I went and got one. Won't be long, I'll be getting a new kidney. I'm all right with that. Sometimes we suffer great heartache because of procrastination. For example, some may wanted to tell their mother, father, someone close to them how much they loved them. And then, and then somewhere down the road, uh, they lose a loved one. And they'll say, boy, I wish I had spent more time telling them how I really feel. It's always been a problem with people. It's even cost people their lives. Because they don't move out and do things that they know they ought to do. It's an excuse. Don't get mad if you're a procrastinator, but procrastination is the excuse of the lazy and the refuge of the incompetent. You imagine what it would be like if your house started burning and your firefighter was a procrastinator. Man, I'm sorry it burnt down, but we hadn't had lunch yet. So we stopped by the Denny's and had some lunch on the way over. How many of you want an ambulance uh, driver to procrastinate? It's our enemy. And if we ever want to get anything done in life, we've got to learn to avoid procrastination. Do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether you want to do it or not. Show some self-discipline in your life. Some people become workaholics and they stay busy every day working, which leaves them no time to do those things which they should be doing, like spending precious time with their husband or wife or their kids. And can I tell you something? Over the years, I've dealt with enough ministers that have sacrificed their family uh, for the cause of ministry. That's idiotic. Because they call themselves ministers, yet the Bible says a man that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever. I spoke with a guy not too long ago. He said, you know what? I'm so involved with ministry, I really haven't had time to get a job. I said, how, how are you taking care of your family? Well, we're having some struggles. So get a job. Go to work. I remember when Paul was dealing with the church at Corinth, the uh, uh, the believers in Jerusalem were going some real th going through some real persecution, and uh, and Paul was working on getting some offerings going that he could bring to the church in Jerusalem, and he told the Corinthians this, and I love this in Second Corinthians eight ten, he said, and here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. He's saying, you know what, you've talked about giving and, and helping, but let's complete it now. Let's actually do it. Congregations today, church congregations, they plan on doing this or that, and, and, why, and it winds up being a bunch of empty talk. We're going to have a planning meeting uh, uh, today to talk about what happened in the KC Tougher Than Hell poker run we had, the benefit, and, uh, and we'll make plans. But did you know those plans on how we're going to handle it next year won't make a bit of difference if we don't follow through? 
How do I know so much about procrastination? You should have seen my garage when we get ready to move. <laughs> I'd been saying, I've got to do something in that garage. But when you move, you see, for some reason, uh, uh, Chris and Dee Dee expected a clean garage, so we had to start moving some stuff out, you know. <laughs> I was tempted to say, all of our junk, we'll just leave it there. You know. They can have a garage sale or throw it away, but it's not their job, see. But why would I have said that? Because I'm a procrastinator. Because I put off some things. There are certain things I don't put off and other things I do. Everybody has a struggle with it, but, but we need to get a hold of it, folks. Hebrews 3.12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We ought not put off helping our brother when our brother's hurting. When we see somebody struggling in life, we ought to be the ones that are going to come there and help them. The Bible says, let him who is spiritual restore such a one. Not to talk about people, not to run them down, but if you see somebody struggling spiritually, don't put it off for somebody else to do it. Run over there and be a part of the restoration of that saint that's having a hard time. When Jesus gave, gave the great commission, he said, Go therefore and make, in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. There's no room for procrastination in the word go. Go and do this. Go therefore and make disciples. We have a responsibility of, as a church to lead people to Christ and to be a blessing in their lives. Do you remember what our, what is our mission statement here? Heart of God Fellowship exists as a church to worship, fellowship, inspire, and train. So part of our deal is not just to worship God, not just a fellowship with God and fellowship with one another, but to inspire people to come to Christ and then inspire them to live for the Lord. Amen? And then to train them up through the Word of God, which is what we're doing today, right now. Train them up in the Word of God. What the Word of God says isn't for just your neighbor, it's for you. We sometimes have a tendency to say, boy, I tell you what, I hope so-and-so heard what pastor said today. No, we need to listen to what it is. Quit putting off till tomorrow what we can do today. I love what Paul the Apostle said in Acts 20. He said, Therefore I testify to you to this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I am not claiming that I do everything right, but I'll tell you what, I can say like the Apostle Paul that I have not shunned to give you the whole counsel of God. I have believed what I've, I've learned and I've taught it to this congregation, but once I teach it, it's up to you to take it and to operate with it. Amen? Not to complain about it. Never here, here, here's a great commandment. Never complain about the pastor. Because the pastor is quite a wonderful human being. <laughs> Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And, and you know, I think most ministers feel that way. You know, when it comes to, in, in the time when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ or the bema, the, the reward seat of Christ, uh, 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 I want to hear the Lord say, listen, you taught people and they ran with it, man. 
I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, listen, there'd be more rewards, but you taught people and they just did whatever they wanted to do. Really? I can hear him now. Do you remember how many times you had to tell your wife and Carla not to talk during the service? Thank you. Uh. <laughs> Galatians 6 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. We talked about that. Don't put that off. Don't, don't use it as, as, uh, as an excuse to talk about people if they're going through a struggle. You know, years ago I was talking to a pastor and he told me, he said, do you hear about that church that started up down, down the road? He said, man, it, uh, they went out of business. I said, why are you smiling? Maybe I'll get some of those people. I said, they never were your people. They're God's people. And when one part of the body of Christ is suffering, we're all suffering because we're all part of that same body. So we would, shouldn't rejoice when other people are struggling. It ought to affect us. We ought to care about it. Amen? Excuses have always been made. I'm going to close this thing down. But listen, in Luke 14, 15, Jesus said, now, now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife. And therefore, I'm in trouble all the time. No, that's not what it is. <laughs> Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. The great invitation has been given. But let me ask you this. How many of you have time? How many of you are, have made excuses why you can't be where God wants you, when God wants you there? What excuses are you using? What's a good enough excuse? I had some people angry at me years ago, which happens periodically here. When I told them, I don't give a flip about you coming and telling me, listen, I'm tired of all the stuff I do. I'm tired. I don't give a flip about you being tired. If no ministry is going to happen until you're fully rested, we're in trouble. Because everybody here works full-time jobs, and they, and they volunteer at the church. Your job isn't a reason not to volunteer here at the church. Because we've got not only ourselves to take care of but we got the kingdom of God to take care of. Amen? So it, with great compassion I just want to tell you I don't give a flip if you're tired. We've got a vision to do to complete inside this church and we're going to get it done. Amen? Have you been putting off becoming a Christian? Because you're not ready to make a commitment to serve God, like that friend I told you was a biker and passed away. Do you, don't you think it's time you start, stop gambling with your soul? Don't you think it's time you quit making excuses for yourself? There are some of you that, that, that you've come so far but you won't go any further than that because you're only going to do what you feel you're comfortable with. And I want to tell you something. God calls us out of our comfort zone to get into some places that, that require faith. 
2 Peter 1, 10 and 11 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. He, he, he ends by saying, now is the accepted time, the day of salvation. Now. If you came here this morning and said, I've been coming to church, but in reality, I'm not committed, then this is the day to get committed. I thank God for some of you that help out with this and help out with that. I know that. I, some of you give into the ministry and you do well with that, but it's more than that. There's probably a part of you that knows there's something else that you can be a part of and you've been putting it off. Well, don't put it off because not only will you be a blessing to the body of Christ, God will bless you for your efforts. Amen? There's a great vision that God has for your life. You know when it starts? Now. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.